Hi everyone, Reverend Dr. Tracy Allshafer. I wanted to talk a little bit today about fear and how to combat fear with yoga practices. Fear is something we have all become acutely aware of in the times that we're living in. Um, whether we're afraid of a virus, the government, um, each other, this is a constant thing that uh, is out there uh, in, the, in the media, um, on social media, in our homes. You can't escape so much talk about things that are stimulating fear. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about how fear actually, how, how does the human body and the mind handle fear? How does that come up? So I'm going to read a couple little things for you because I think it's important to understand um, the whole process of what we're going through um, as a being when we have a response to stimuli. So um, a woman by the name of Julia Layton from um, an article that she wrote says that fear is a chain reaction in the brain that starts with a stressful stimulus and ends with the release of chemicals that cause all kinds of things like racing heart, fast breathing, energized muscles, um, and then initiates this fight or flight response that you've probably heard of. So because there are literally 100 billion cells, uh, nerve cells that are constantly firing and transferring information and triggering all of these responses, um, our brain is a big component to, to fear and how we are experiencing fear. And some of those responses are very slow responses. Some of them are very fast responses. And there's a place for both of those. If you're home alone at night and you hear a strange noise in the house, um, you know, there's, there's two ways that we respond to fear. In the very quick way, parts of our brain are going to wake us up so that we can react if we need to react. And then other parts are going to kind of allow us to walk through it with our mind and say, okay, what are the possible reasons that this could be happening? And there's a place for both of those, those things, right? So our sympathetic nervous system is the one that our brain triggers for potentially life-threatening situations. And um, that sympathetic system puts us into that fight or flight mode. So this affects really our whole body. We have so many, um, so many parts of our being that get sped up when we're uh, when the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. So our blood glucose levels rise, uh, our pupils dilate, our muscles tighten. Um, response is sent uh, oxygen to our arms and our legs so that we can get up and run if we need to. Um, and what happens when that happens is that the blood goes to those places and less in the brain or oxygen, I'm sorry. So the brain isn't able to think clearly. Non-essential systems like the digestive system and the immune system start to shut down so that more energy can flow into the parts of the body that need them for these emergency functions. So the brain has trouble focusing. So all of these things are happening to us when our when we are in this sympathetic nervous system response. Um, and although you know we still need these um, mechanisms for certain things, um, for the most part, some of them are outdated. We don't have the same survival fears that we did, you know, hundreds of years ago, where we were fighting for our life, maybe being chased by uh, you know, lions, tigers, tigers, and bears in the wild. I mean, obviously some people still experience those things, but for the most part, some of those fear-based responses are no longer as important as they used to be. So why is it that we still have them or are triggered by them? Well, there's a few things that we humans have that 
continue to be a, a part of this equation of fear. One is anticipation, <laughs> right? Anticipation. Um, we've heard about things. We've seen things on TV. We've heard about things that can happen. We read about them. Someone told us about them. So we're anticipating the worst case scenario that a lot of people do. The other thing that I want to talk about are concepts like conditioning, genetically being predisposed, and universal fears, right? They're always um, that fear kind of permeates our life. And many in the Western world have begun to deal with fear um, or fear-based things such as anxiety um, through medications. And there's some medications that are available that you may want to talk to your doctor about. Um, some therapists work with things like exposure therapy so that you allow yourself to be exposed to a fear um, to work potentially through them. So one thing that I have uh, taught a lot and um, we talk about this much in teacher training and in certain workshops uh, that I have with yoga is that all fear can be broken down into one basic primal fear, right? It's our survival. It's the fear of death. Um, no matter what our fear is, if we say what's the worst thing that can happen and we keep saying that no matter what it is, um, I'm afraid to be alone. Okay, what's the worst thing that can happen if you're alone? Well, if I'm alone, um, you know, something bad could happen to me. Well, what's the worst thing that can happen if something bad happens to you and you're alone? Well, maybe no one would be there to help me and I could die. It doesn't matter what the fear is, you continue to ask that question, what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? And eventually you get to that root, I could die, right? So death is the, the bottom line fear that we all have. And it's real because 100% we are going to die. Mortality rate is 100%. So when I heard that once and I realized that and I really allowed myself to take that in, I realized, okay, this is going to happen. Maybe it's been preordained. Maybe as the yogis say, you have a certain number of breaths and at the when you reach that number, that's your time for your spirit to leave your body. And that, I think, brings in the spiritual component. What are your spiritual beliefs? Do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe in a cyclical process of the soul and the spirit. If so, then there is an understanding that everything is going to move through this cycle and that death is only part of the cycle. Death is only a part of the equation. It's needed to come back for rebirth, <laughs> right? So if you don't believe in reincarnation, if you don't believe in um, these cycles uh, or pathways of the soul, then you may struggle a little bit more. And that brings up attachment, right? Our attachment to all of the things in this life and that, well, I can't bear the thought of not having all of these things in our life. And that includes the important people in our life. So, in yoga, yoga, yoga practices are a complete body, mind, spirit yoking. So it's really important to, to sit and understand what your spiritual understanding is of life and death and to maybe reconcile some things around that before you even go any further. And I think there is this Western concept that we can't talk about death. Death is a bad thing. Death um, you know, brings up more fear and we don't want to talk about that because we don't want to be, but actually talking about 
death and dying because it is such a real thing will actually calm the fear not bring up more of the fear so if we allow ourselves to talk about this process of death and ultimately dying and and leaving our body and and how do we feel about the next stage of that do do we go to just heaven or hell and that's it okay then maybe live the best life that you can and be the best person that you can so that you go to the good place <laughs> right and in that case why be afraid you know the bible not that i've read the entire thing but i've heard from many people that the bible references fear not about 365 times so do, so it, why fear we're told don't fear yet there is this primal fear this fear of death and it's a very real thing we have yoga practices um that have been around for thousands and thousands of years. The yogis developed these practices, understanding our whole being, body, mind, and spirit, all of the body systems. They, they knew and understood that there was this mechanism that needed to be shifted and changed. And so part of, um, part of what we do in yoga practices is, is shifting from that, the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. So deep breathing, you know, breath is the most important part of yoga. I've always said that. New students ask me all the time, what should I practice? And I say breathing, yoga breathing. They don't like that answer, but it's really important one. Yoga breathing, yoga breathing, yoga breathing. So deep breathing, um, because now, uh, you know, thousands of years after the <laughs> yogis developed these um, these practices, science has come along and done studies and we know the positive effects. So deep breathing lowers our blood pressure and our heart rate. It lowers the levels of stress. It improves our immune system. It increases feelings of calm and reduces the lactic acid buildup, which allows our muscles to relax. Um, Deep breathing activates, again, that parasympathetic nervous system, controlling our rest and relaxation response. And it quiets the sympathetic. So there are um, three big keys to yoga breathing that I wanna talk about in respect to, um, to all of that. Um, one is belly breathing. So most people, when they're stressed or fearful, restrict their breath and they tend to breathe really shallow in the chest. In fact, if you ask somebody that's really stressed out to take a deep breath, they'll quite often go <sighs> like that, right? <sighs> Real quick and sharp in the chest. And you'll notice the inhale is longer than the exhale. They're not using the diaphragm at all. And the diaphragm is a really important muscle that sits at the bottom of the rib cage and it has these tendons that elongate down to the lumbar spine. When we breathe with the belly, when we do diaphragmatic breathing, these tendons um, move up and down. The diaphragm moves up and down. So the belly fills, expands, and contracts. And it has been said now that the diaphragm and diaphragmatic breathing is actually about 60, maybe more, 60, 65, possibly 70% of our breathing capacity. So if I'm only breathing shallowly or sharply in my chest, I'm breathing already only at 30 to 40% of my total breathing capacity that in itself is going to create some anxiety or fear in, within me because I'm not breathing right. I'm not breathing fully. I might feel somewhat suffocated without even acknowledging that that's actually what's happening. So, <clears throat> so we want to encourage belly breathing. So important. So you can put your hands on your belly. <clears throat> 
And what you want to do is keep your mouth closed, breathe through the nostrils. So you have many more nerve endings around the nostrils. And we also have major um, nadis, which are these energy channels, similar to the nervous system, only you can't dissect the body and see them. But the yogis nonetheless figured it out. There are these two main nadi channels that come up and terminate through the nostrils and into our third eye. So <clears throat> many reasons to, um, to work the belly breath and to breathe through the nose particularly. So when you inhale, you want to imagine your belly is like a balloon, like a rubber balloon, and I'll let it fill out as you inhale. So again, we have this Western predisposition to suck the belly in, that we can't be seen with a large rotund belly. And yet we see pictures of the Buddha and he's got this big, happy, full belly, right? Um, the Buddha has a quote on fear. He says, fear does not prevent death, it prevents life. Fear does not prevent death, it prevents life. So what we want to do is allow ourselves to breathe into the belly, let the belly fill on the inhalation. And then you want to take a slow exhale and guide the belly back towards the spine. Right? So when you're inhaling, you're filling the belly. And when you're exhaling, you're guiding the belly back towards the spine. And you want it to, you want to work towards getting it that slow. Inhale, fill the belly. Exhaling, belly retreats back. And you're actually using abdominal muscles. At least in the beginning, you want to squeeze actively until you develop the diaphragmatic breathing. Once you develop it, it's going to be a very natural way to breathe. You'll notice that's how you breathe. In fact, if you watch a baby, you're going to see this wave with the belly that occurs just very naturally as a baby breathes. The response of breathing shallow in the chest happens into adulthood as we experience and understand stress as our body is reacting to stress we forget how to breathe appropriately with the belly so this is a relearning of our natural way of breath which is going to allow the right part of the nervous system the relaxation part of the nervous system to come in and take over so for those of you that cannot do it in this position, in a seated position, just can't make it happen, just can't do it. I always say lie down, put a bag of rice on your belly, something to resist. And as you inhale, try to push the bag of rice up. And then on the exhale, pull it down. And trust me, that always works. Give it a try. So belly breathing, first deep breathing that you have to understand. <clears throat> Second breathing practice I want to talk about is 448, um, <clears throat> or what some people refer to as kumbhaka or retention breath. It is what we um, do with the breath, the cycles of the breath. So again, if I ask a very stressed out person to take that deep breath and they go <gasps> like that, <clears throat> there was really two parts of the breath, a quick inhale and a faster exhale. What we want to do is actually lengthen the exhalation and we want to add for a pause, a retention. So four, four, and eight actually means inhale to a count of four, hold the breath for a count of four, and then exhale to a count of eight. Now this can be difficult for beginners you can either speed up your counting <clears throat> or you can revert to a three, three, six pattern. Let me show you how it works. Still want to activate the belly breathing and inflate for a count of four. So one, two, three, four. Hold the breath for one, two, three, four, 
Exhale for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> now be careful not to collapse your body when you're trying to pull back and exhale. Keep the spine straight. Inhale for one, two, three, four. Hold for one, two, three, four. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you'll want to practice that over and over again. But even after just doing one or two rounds, maybe three rounds, if you're really effectively doing it, you're going to feel this calming energy coming over your entire system. It's undeniable that you can't not relax. It's going to happen. So it's so important. Um, that lengthening of the exhalation is also super important. Um, again, make sure when you're doing any kind of deep breathing, um, some yoga teachers say it's um, the one to two ratio. Whatever you inhale to, you exhale twice as long. So if you, even if you take a natural inhalation and you count to six or seven, then you want to exhale to 12 or 14. So all of these things will help you understand deep breathing, which will initiate this relaxation response, um, this parasympathetic nervous system response. So really, really important um, to activate that so that we start to calm the mind. Um, so another quick quote, which I think is really important with respect to that, Lao Tzu, which um, I remember if he was a student of Confucius or studied Confucianism, but he says there is no illusion greater than fear. No illusion greater than fear. Our mind um, creates a lot of that illusion for us. Confucius himself said, if you look into your own heart, and you find nothing wrong there, what is there to worry about? What is there to fear? So if you look into your own heart. So again, illusion is something that we either um, see something inappropriately, um, it's not the truth, but yet we're fixating on it. It's not something we're discerning for ourselves, And the heart center becomes a really important part of our yogic combating of fear as well. And I'll talk about that really soon too. So deep breathing, you have to learn it. You have to do it daily. It is going to be so beneficial. Your, your whole being is going to feel healthier and better, not just your brain, your heart, your lungs, um, every part of your being, your immune system, uh, everything is going to function on a better level with just deep breathing. So that's key. Another key in yoga are forward bends. So forward bends or any time, if I extend my legs, sorry, I'm, I'm working around lots of dogs today. <laughs> but if I extend my legs out and I crease from my hips and I drop my head down, I'm going into a forward bend. Right? This is bending my trunk or, or um, the upper part of the body down towards the lower part of the body. This is a forward bend. Forward bends are very calming on the nervous system. They allow us to um, relax muscle tension, to quiet our mind, and they also reduce sensory stimulation. So we're kind of drawing in. We're drawing into ourselves. So if you're very anxious and worried, you want to eliminate so many back bends and do more forward bends in a yoga practice, right? So that's another key. 
in a moment, I'm going to do uh, a yoga practice with you, just a very short one for combating fear. So then I want to talk to you a little bit about the energy systems. So the, there are these energy uh, vortexes in our body called the chakras. And in India, where yoga was developed, the yogis talked about six or seven that, um, that relate to different areas of our body. The first one is at the base of the spine. It sits the lowest to the ground, so it's associated with the earth. And it's also associated with anything that is grounding, anything that allows you to feel grounded, to feel secure. Um, so things like security, things like foundation, things like safety, um, survival, that's all first chakra stuff. So performing postures that are first chakra are key to combating fear through yoga. It allows us to feel, oh, okay, here is the earth. I, this is tangible. This is real. Whatever my mind is focusing on that's creating the fear may or may not be. Maybe I'm embellishing it or making it worse than it actually is. Um, or, or just, you know, contemplating that it could possibly happen. Maybe it's not even in my realm of existence, but my mind is getting it. But this is tangible. This is real. I can feel the earth and I can feel the steadiness of it when I push into it. And when I push into it and I feel the steadiness, I'm reminded everything is okay. Everything is okay in this moment. That's another reason to bring the deep breathing in to the postures and the practice, right? So I breathe into these um, first chakra poses. I feel the earth. I'm doing my deep breathing, which is triggering my parasympathetic nervous system, the calming, relaxing response, and everything is good. In this moment, everything is good, right? Everything feels good. So that's really important, first chakra poses. The final component is the fourth chakra, and I won't go through all of them. It's not a chakra discussion or lecture, but you need to understand the significance in re relationship with fear. So fourth chakra is our heart center, and it is from the center of the chest, um, center of the back, and it emanates out through the arms. And this is the area where we feel and express love. Love is said to heal all, right? Um, Marianne Williamson is famous for saying, darkness is merely the absence of light and fear is merely the absence of love. Um, so Marianne Williamson is very famous for saying that fear is the absence um, of love, right? So when we come into a place of love, when we open to the expression of love, we are... Um, allowing the energy of fear to move out. There is also this um, uh, very real aspect of the rib cage um, protecting the lungs. And there are lots of little intercostal muscles um, and even the big pectoralis muscle in the chest. When we are stressed or fearful, these muscles contract, as we've already talked about, and I start to pull in. And the process of me pulling in even doesn't allow the 30 to 40% of my lungs that might be breathing to breathe at their full capacity because they're restricted. So when I do postures that open my chest, I now stretch all the muscles in the rib cage, which allows at least my lungs to do their optimum breathing and their optimum capacity. It's still not where we, where we really ideally wanna be, but it's again, another start. So those of you that are struggling to really do the four, four, eight breath or the um, diaphragmatic breathing, the belly breathing, maybe you need to open the chest a little bit more too. As the lungs can take deeper breaths then maybe you'll free up that space and restriction to come down into the diaphragmatic breathing. So these are all components of that and really important ones. So, um, so what I wanna start with is a very short yoga practice 
for combating fear using all these key components, okay? So first we're going to do, um, uh, you wanna work very slow. You wanna hold the poses and breathe into them, ideally with belly breaths, um, focusing maybe on a longer exhalation, for sure, with a longer exhalation, um, and feeling the earth, feeling grounded, okay? So the first pose that you might want to explore is this forward fold, this half forward fold. So a full forward fold is difficult for most people. So I like to start with a half forward fold. You can bend one leg and bring the foot to the inner thigh. Let that knee drop down. You want to lift your spine and then exhale, creasing from the hips, folding down. Now try to keep the back fairly straight. You can also use a strap around the foot to hold the ankle. And then close your eyes, drop your head, and allow yourself to breathe deeply. So it's a slow inhalation and a long exhalation. Inhaling. Exhaling. Inhaling, exhaling, inhale, exhale, inhale again, exhale, and maybe one more. Inhaling, exhaling. And then you can start to walk back up. Ideally, hold the pose for six to 10 of those deep breaths. Switch the legs and do the other side. Lift the spine. Crease from the hips, start to come down. Doesn't matter if you're flexing this foot or the leg is relaxed. Just drop your head and take those deep breaths. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. And last one, deep breath, inhale. Exhale. And then walk back up slowly. And the next pose is another forward fold called tortoise. So you touch the feet, but you don't bring them real close into the body. Keep them further out. You can always prop something under the knees like a pillow if you need it. We're gonna crease forward again and imagine that you're a tortoise tucking into its shell. You can hold the feet. Some people more flexible, bring the hands under the ankles or legs. Doesn't matter, do your best. Also, if you feel limited, you can put a pillow or a bolster or some folded blankets under your belly, okay? So grab anything you need, hold forward and drop the head towards the feet. Now it doesn't have to touch, but for some of you it will. And we're going to hold it for five, six, ten deep breaths. So let's begin. Inhale. Exhale.
come back up slowly. I also want to add one other thing. When we're talking about relaxation in the body, um, the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in the body, travels through everything, also helps trigger the relaxation response if we stimulate the vagus nerve. Now, some yoga teachers say if you put your forehead down um, or if you wear an eye pillow that covers part of your forehead that you're stimulating the vagus nerve. So one thing that you can try is that if your head's not touching your feet in this pose is to put a block either on your feet one way or another so that when you come down, your forehead can touch. And so again, this can also be very relaxing. You can try to use the block as well in your half forward fold. So you can figure out where it needs to go and let your forehead come down. Maybe it rests up on your leg. I find it a little awkward to work with the block in a forward fold, which is why I didn't mention it. Um, but you can certainly try. So that's a couple of things that you can do. Okay, so half forward fold and tortoise, two forward bends, six to 10 deep breaths. Once you come out of that, we're gonna move to child's pose and from child's pose to crocodile. Maybe a little bit of a problem with my partner, but let's see what we can do. <laughs> so in child's pose, you come up onto the knees. Again, it's a forward fold. The toes will touch, the knees are gonna open. You can put anything under your belly that you might wanna have. The idea is to get the forehead down on the floor. So some people stretch the arms out, some people bring the arms behind them. It really doesn't matter, it's whatever feels good. The forehead wants to get down on the floor. So if you're wearing glasses, you have to remove those and let the forehead come down. Now I can actually stack my arms too and put my head down. And then try to take again those six to 10 deep breaths here. Really work with that belly breath. It's really easy to get lost in a child's pose and lose track of time, in which case just keep breathing and let yourself be there. Otherwise, we're gonna move into a crocodile, which is lying on the belly. My partner doesn't seem to wanna to move, so I'm gonna work around him. So when you come down onto the stomach, However, you can safely do that. <laughs> oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> You're gonna bring your hands again underneath. So if you had your hands under your forehead, just switch which hand is on top. What I love about this pose, you're gonna put the forehead down and rest. And the whole body is resting, but this allows your abdomen to make contact with the floor and that's gonna allow you to take those deep diaphragmatic breaths. So similar to pushing the bag of rice up, now you can push your belly into the floor. So you inhale, expand the belly to the floor, and you exhale, contract. And I want you to take another six to 10 deep breaths here.
Now when you're done, you're going to roll onto your back. Just simply roll over. Now my other partner is coming. You've seen her walking through. <laughs> so another way to combat stress is to have a pet. <laughs> they say caring for another being helps you um, create more empathy and um, it also helps to calm this, this process of, of petting or rubbing um, another being helps to calm your nervous system too. And notice if you're petting with your breath, right? So you exhale slowly and you inhale, lift your arm and you exhale slowly and they'll respond to you as well. They really understand this relaxation response. So knees to chest on the back. Great way to stretch your back and spine. You can rock or you can be really still and hug the knees in and just take several breaths. So again, those deep breaths. So this is very similar to child's pose, only we're on our back. So it's another forward fold, stimulating a relaxation response. And what I'm going to show you in a moment is our final pose, which is legs up the wall. So legs up the wall has been proven to be very calming and relaxing. And what I'd like you to do is try to get a blanket and open it up maybe about like this. And you can fold it two or three times to be about this wide. You're going to put it down so that your chest is propped up. Because remember, we have that fourth chakra to think about. As I come down, obviously my wall has a little something in front of it. So I'm not going to have a wall per se. Hey, baby. Here's another one to pet. <laughs> so you can virtually pet my dogs. Um, but you're going to have your head off of the little um, blanket. Your arms and shoulders will be on a little bit propped up and you're going to open your arms wide. And then the legs go up a wall. So I don't have a wall here to support my legs. You'll have to find enough room somewhere in the home so that your heels all the way to your butt are against the wall. So try to get into this space, arms open, legs up the wall. And here you want to do some deep breathing for anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to deeply breathe in and taking a slower exhale all the way out. And repeat that breath and hold yourself here.
When you're done, you're gonna come down with the legs, roll over onto your side. You can roll onto the right side, that way that the heart is not being compressed. <laughs> right, baby? Take a moment and then press yourself back up to seated. And guys, that's it. That is a short yoga practice to combat fear. Hopefully you're feeling way more relaxed than when you first began. I'm going to end with a couple more quotes that I really love. One is by um, Martin Luther King Jr. Who says, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. And so there has to be this other component within you, this spiritual side of you that understands, that has hope for a beautiful world and a wonderful life and, and knows that that's achievable. There has to be that, that installation of inspiration from something within you. So again, if you're exploring that spiritual side of yourself and you're finding a void, I really encourage you to find and connect to something that is greater than you. The moon and the stars speak to so many people today. Maybe it's as simple as that. Go out and look up into the sky and understand the vastness of our world and the unlimited possibilities that come with an expanded awareness that transcends this egocentric, this, this, the world revolves around me mentality. That is such a key. So Yogananda um, was another really amazing uh, yogi. Um, his story, autobiography of a yogi inspired many people to practice yoga over the years. He has many quotes about fear. Look fear in the face and it will cease to trouble you. Again, speaking to exposure. Your trials did not come to punish you, but to awaken you. So seeing through the illusion, there's so much more that's being presented to you in everything. And he also says, trust in God and destroy fear. So again, coming back to spiritual, God may not be the word for you. Maybe it's goddess. Maybe it's, again, the universe or universal consciousness. Maybe it's spirit. It doesn't matter what you call that higher power or that understanding of everything being interconnected and being such a intricate part of each other. We come back to the base of love we come back to the base of some spiritual understanding. We breathe into our body. We do these forward folds. We focus on the long exhalations. You cannot feel better. You cannot feel better. And even though chaos can be happening around you, as it so often is, our world is chaotic. Even though all of that can be happening around you, the highest part of you is going to feel that at the end of the day, all is well. I can breathe. Tomorrow the sun comes up. It's another new day with infinite possibilities, right? So transcending fear has to come from all of these different levels. And I'm not saying it's easy. And I know that so many people struggle with all of the different diseases of fear. I'm just saying, open and expand to all the possibilities that are available to you. Try these simple yoga techniques daily, and you let me know if you don't feel better. But I don't think that's possible. I know it's not possible. If you really pull, put all of yourself into it. And then, when you are faced with something that is creating fear, you can hopefully attack it from a very mindful place. 
from a place of true discernment. Is this a real threat? Is this a real fear? Is this something that I need to respond to on a visceral level? Do my muscles need to contract? Do I need to tighten my breath? Do I need to, you know, fear touching another person? Personal contact? Love for each other? Do I need to really fear that? Or can I come from a different place? Can I really truly understand what is happening in this moment? And what is really the most important thing? I think if you do these simple things, you're going to uncover a lot more than how to combat fear. I think you're going to find a lot of truth and you're going to find a lot of beauty in the world. Thank you so much for listening, for tuning in. Please share this with anyone uh, that you know that might be able to benefit from these simple techniques. And certainly if you feel that you need to reach out to a professional to assist you in mental health or any other avenue of, of your being, please reach out. This is not going to work for everyone, but I invite you to add it as a part of whatever practices you're doing, whatever medications that you're taking, and see if it doesn't help. I know it will. Thank you so much. Love to all. Namaste.